Thank you to the Institute of Historical Research for inviting me to speak about a brilliant Scotsman who, in the first half of the 19th century, was the world's best-selling author on landscape architecture, gardening and horticulture, John Claudius Loudon. Though much more famous in his own time than today, his portrait still hangs on the staircase of the Linnaean Society at the entrance to the Royal Academy Courtyard in London. I'm going to speak about his background, about his plans for London, and about the possible influence of his ideas on what is now called green infrastructure. His term, following the rural improvers of the 18th century, was metropolitan improvements. But let's start with his second forename, Claudius. It came from his maternal grandfather, Claudius Summers. Both his daughters included Claudius in their son's names, and Loudon's wife, born Jane Webb, saw a singular coincidence in the boys' lives and characters. Both left Scotland in the early 20s. Both became famous. Both were dedicated to the public good. Claudius Buchanan, John's first cousin, but 17 years older, went to India as a missionary. He sought, in his own words, to civilise the Hindus. This seems, and was, what we would call a politically incorrect opinion, and his views were in fact criticised at the time. His plausible defence was that his primary objection was to the North Indian practice of sati, wife burning. With support from both Hindus and Christians, this became illegal in 1829, though it took another 170 years to end it completely. John Claudius Loudon was born in Cambuslang, where his maternal grandfather had lived during the extraordinary occurrences which took place in that valley in 1742. In a small rural town, George Whitfield attracted congregations of up to 30,000 people to what became famous as the Preaching Brays. These brays slopes in English, are now a public park. Whitfield helped John Wesley to found the Methodist movement. The name was given to it by others on account of their strictly methodical approach to worship, fasting, life and public service. Claudius Summers, the grandfather, became an elder of the car and his grandsons followed his Methodism in their personal habits, though I don't think either belonged to the Methodist Church. Rather than the I Claudius of Robert Graves' book, who invaded England, the grandfather and his grandsons are likely to have been named after Claudius II, also called the deified Claudius, who was then believed to have been related to Constantine the First, loved because he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. On arriving in London, John Claudius Loudon's first publication, at the age of 20, was an article for the literary journal on the manner of laying out the public squares of London. He saw them as being of the greatest consequence to the health of its inhabitants and to the beauty of that city, adding that nothing can be more absurd than the manner in which these squares have been laid out and planted. The phrase, nothing can be more absurd, is very Loudon-esque. And if you look at the condition of Red Lion and Bloomsbury squares in 1800, you might think that he had a fair point. A key characteristic of the methodical Claudian streak in John Loudon 
was his public spiritedness. In 1806, he wrote in his journal that I am now 23 years of age and perhaps a third of my life has passed away. And yet, what have I done to benefit my fellow men? Before going on to talk about his proposed metropolitan improvements, I'll say something about sources and something about Loudon's life and character. The best secondary source for Loudon is Melanie Simo's book on Loudon and the Landscape. She spent 15 years working on it, and I'm most impressed that she did it so quickly, given the amazing number of books Loudon Road. There's also a 2014 book on The Loudons and the Gardening Press by Sarah Dewis, which owes more to feminism and critical theory than to an interest in planning or design. It's a decent book, but not relevant to this lecture. There's also an older book by John Glogue, not particularly about landscape architecture. There are four primary sources for Loudon. One, letters. The few I've seen are of little interest, but I'm sure there are more because he was an inveterate correspondent. Two, Loudon's published works, which are very extensive. Three, his wife's biography of her husband, which is short illuminating and riveting. And four, Loudon's private journal, which was written in French. I had a letter from Howard Colvin, a well-known architectural historian, saying that he believed it was destroyed in the 1940 Blitz. Maybe so, but it could turn up, and if it did, it would be a fundamental resource for the history of modern landscape architecture and I'd have to brush up my French. There's also a possibility that the diaries of his wife, Jane, and or his daughter, Agnes, will turn up. B. Howe used Agnes' albums when writing her 1961 biography of Jane, but I haven't managed to trace them. The passages B. Howe quotes give a charming glimpse a family life inside the home office which John designed and in which he worked with Jane as his amanuensis. It's been described as the progenitor of the semi-detached villa and deserves to be celebrated for its role in the development of landscape architecture, landscape planning and landscape urbanism. Melanie Simo described Loudon as a meticulous designer, a sound theorist, an eminent horticulturalist, and a charitable, sometimes charming, man who was often the first to propose an innovation that would later be developed by others. His work on the Greenbelt is a fine example of this. I see Loudon as nearer to polymath status than anyone else who has devoted their lives to landscape architecture. He authored the first specialist encyclopedias of gardening, architecture, plants and agriculture, as well as his eight-volume illustrated Arboretum Britannicum, which impoverished his family, and several journals too. But in case I exaggerate Loudon's virtues, I should also say that he was intemperate, fanatical and self-contradictory. He wrote late into the night, every night, and appears to have sent his work to the printers without a second thought. I'm a little out of sympathy with some of his proposals, like the recommendation that Edinburgh should lay out Arthur's seat as a public cemetery and park. Loudon was, to quote Seymour again, a writer, teacher, activist, publicist, 
man of ideas, inventor and designer, but more a craftsman than an artist. His wife estimated that he dictated on average five and a half pages of printed octavo every day. She called it unwearied industry. And this despite constant pain, disability and ill health. He was far ahead of his time. Just as Jane, an early science fiction writer, was a woman ahead of her time. In The Mummy, written at the age of 24, she envisaged that in 2026, England would have a female sovereign, universal education, beautiful gardens by the Thames, steam engines for milking cows, and machines for making shoes at one blow, like crock shoes, and much else that has come about. Politically, John Claudius was a liberal, a reformer and a utilitarian. He was friends with Jeremy Bentham and attended Dr Southwood Smith's illegal dissection of Bentham's body as part of an anatomy lecture. On religious questions, Loudon tended to scepticism and thought that other religions could also underpin morality. John Wilson, a fellow Scot, called him a wretched ignoramus and asked, does not the blockhead know that the Christian religion is the true religion? Loudon's parents moved from Cambuslang outside Glasgow to take a lease on a farm 40 miles outside Edinburgh. The farm was beside the Goga Burn, and most of it is now the apron for Edinburgh Airport. As a futurologist, John Loudon would probably approve of this. Their farmhouse was called Curse Hall. A curse, the modern form of the old Scots word curse, is an area of fertile, low-lying land near a river. This is where John learned about farming, gardening and land drainage. His dad gave him an area to look after in the garden. Goga Mains was the home farm for what is now called Goga Castle. John's radicalism could derive in part from having seen his father work hard while the nobleman lived in luxury. That's a speculation. On the evidence of William Loudon's tomb, the family was related to the Earls of Loudon, who owned Loudon Castle in Ayrshire. This was so enlarged after 1804 that it became known as the Windsor of Scotland. And that's possibly when William left Scotland to live near John in England. John Loudon said nothing of his possibly noble ancestry. He had called for the abolition of hereditary titles and the pensioning off of the royal family. But he was definitely influenced by his father, who had the skills and knowledge of an enlightened farmer. By this, I mean a farmer who worked in the spirit of the Scottish Enlightenment and sought to apply scientific knowledge to the practicalities of agriculture. In the next decade, after leaving Scotland, Loudon worked both as a landscape designer and as a farmer. Together, they made him comfortably rich. By 1812, he'd saved £15,000, which, according to the Bank of England's inflation calculator, equates to a million pounds in 2020. But he had severe health problems, having become rheumatic after a journey from Wales on the outside of a coach in terrible weather to London. So he switched to a more sedentary life as an author. He learned the languages of the countries he planned to visit and two European tours gave him a mass of new material 
for his first Encyclopedia of Gardening. Jane Loudon thought it contained the world's first illustrated history of design gardens, and I agree with her. She also thought that her husband should have published a separate account of his garden tours. I agree with this too. And if he was working today, he would have made a much better job of a garden visit website than I could ever do. The 1822 edition of the Encyclopedia of Gardening has a section on public gardens, which draws on these European tours. He wrote that our continental neighbours have hitherto greatly excelled us in this department of gardening, almost every town of consequence having its promenades for the citizens a cheval and au pied. Loudon therefore urged the creation of public promenades in London. His first example of a public promenade is Karlsruhe in southwest Germany, which he visited. The design had been commissioned by Margrave Charles William, an autocrat who admired the Baroque spirit of Versailles and wanted even more centrality for his own Paris and ego. The design centred on the lead tower from which 32 avenues radiated to make a fan city enclosed by a circular carriage promenade. My guess is that this is what inspired Loudon to propose another circular promenade for London. But instead of an autocratic Baroque design, Loudon made an empirical proposal. It's an attractive plan, so I'll give you the details, using a soft Scots accent to mark quotations. Loudon wrote that. A promenade might be formed in the margin of London of a very interesting kind by continuing the street called the New Road through Hyde Park, entering close to where Kensington Gardens leave off, proceeding thence across the Serpentine River and coming out exactly opposite Sloane Street, then along this street and part of the King's Road to the road leading to Vauxhall Bridge. From this bridge, along roads already formed, and as may be seen by the map, well suited to lead to Blackheath, then turn towards London through Greenwich Park, so as to display the best views of the metropolis over Greenwich Hospital. Then, form a viaduct or road on a cast-iron colonnade across the river sufficiently high to admit ships in full sail to pass under. Descend this and join the city road, which joins the new road and completes the circle. This course, with the exception of the bridge, might be formed at no great expense or derangement of property, would give a grand view of the metropolis and by now and then deviating from the direct road and returning to it, Kensington Gardens, Hammersmith Nursery, the King's Road Gardens, Chelsea Garden, the Garden of Lodges at Hackney, the Regent's Park, Highgate, Hampstead, and all the most interesting gardens, scenery and objects close to London might be rapidly glanced at in one day. Loudon's reference to the 1822 promenade being based on roads already formed draws on the genius of the place, landscape theory, and not, for example, on Christopher Wren's Baroque plan for rebuilding London after the Great Fire of 1666. Loudon's 1829 plan may owe something to Karlsruhe but was designed for a whole metropolis and all its people. It was not meant 
to glorify a king and looks geometrical only because it was diagrammatic. Duncan Bowie, in a 2017 book on the radical and socialist tradition in British planning, comments that it is the landscape architect John Claudius Loudon, a friend of Bentham, who is generally credited with producing the first plan for London which explicitly proposed the notion of a green belt. The reference is to Loudon's 1829 hints on breathing places for the metropolis. I've put the plan on the LAA website but will also give some quotations and then make some comments. London was expanding rapidly in 1829 and Loudon's aim was to devise some plan by which the metropolis may be enlarged so as to cover any space whatever with perfect safety to the inhabitants in respect to the supply of provisions, water and fresh air and to the removal of filth of every description, the maintenance of general cleanliness and the dispatch of business. He goes on to state that our plan is very simple, that of surrounding London as it already exists with a zone of open country at the distance of say one mile or one mile and a half from what may be considered the centre, say from St Paul's. This predates Ebenezer Howard's green belt by 69 years. Loudon's transport plan was very comprehensive. In all the main streets, radiating and concentric, public conveyances like the omnibuses of Paris, propelled by steam or otherwise according to the improvements of the age and country, every man might thus ride from any one point in the metropolis to any other point without loss of time and at very little expense. Thus, there could never be an inhabitant who would be farther than half a mile from an open, airy situation in which he was free to walk or ride. Since London's first railway to Greenwich opened in 1836, all its streets at that time were for what we would now classify as green transport, walking or horse powered. The bicycle hadn't been invented. Loudon went further and advised that under every street we would have a sewer sufficiently large and so contrived as to serve at the same time as a subway for the mains of water and gas. The matters conveyed by the sewer we would not allow to be all wasted in a river, but here and there in what we would call sewer works to be placed in the country zones. We would strain the water by means of machinery so as to gain from it almost every particle of manure held in mixture. This was written a decade before the first experiments in sewage treatment. It's now almost two centuries since Loudon's proposal for recycling sewage. His advice became official policy in the UK after an EU directive was adopted in 1991. But even now, only three quarters of London's sewage sludge is processed for use on farmland. Before that, most of it went via rivers into the sea. Loudon's proposals for the use of greenbelt land are not unlike Ebenezer Howard's. He wanted the land to be used for urban-related agriculture. He was concerned with what Dieter Helm has called natural capital. And, of course, 
he wanted space for leisure and recreation. We would also introduce pieces of water, rocks, quarries, stones, wild places in imitation of heaths and caverns, grottos, dells, dingles, ravines, hills, valleys and other natural looking scenes with walks and roads straight and winding, shady and open and to complete the whole there should be certain bands of music to perambulate the zones, so as at certain hours and at certain places every day of the year. Though his own preference was for small towns, Loudon also had a far-sighted plan for the future expansion of his breathing zones. He wrote that the metropolis may be extended in alternate mile zones of buildings with half-mile zones of country or gardens till one of the zones touched the sea as a plan for an unwanted contingency. This is much more visionary than any subsequent plan for containing London's sprawl. It involved country planning in advance of town planning. Loudon also had a far-sighted administrative proposal. It was for a committee being appointed to carry the law into execution. He wrote that it should begin by purchasing such lands as were to be sold in the outskirts of the metropolis in order to be able at a future period to exchange them for lands destined to become the central circle of the first zone. The idea of governments purchasing land in advance of development would have dealt with the unearned increment problem, land speculation, that so troubled Ebenezer Howard. It's still proposed in the UK from time to time and operates in several countries around the world, notably in East Asia. It was used for the post-1946 British New Towns and continues to have supporters in the UK. Two other points about Loudon's London plan need to be made. First, he was realistic about timing and wrote that it could not be carried into execution in such a metropolis as London unless in consequence of accident or revolution in less time than one or two centuries, because it could never be recommended to purchase and pull down so many valuable houses as would be requisite. He was a realist. Second, Loudon emphasised that we have drawn the boundary lines as perfect circles. But in the execution of the project, this is by no means necessary, nor even desirable. Howard had the same idea, and his drawings were often emblazoned with the caution, diagram only, plan cannot be drawn until site selected. I see Loudon's breathing zone plan as a prime example of urban landscape architecture. By landscape architecture, I mean the art of composing landform water and plants with buildings and pavings to make good public space. It's the Claudian focus on the public interest which distinguishes landscape architecture from garden design. 
Curiously, the French version of the name Claudius was given to a painter who had a profound influence on English landscape design, Claude Lorraine, for both reasons. I recommend Claudian as a technical term in landscape architecture. Loudon did not describe himself as a landscape architect, though he knew of the term, promoted its use, and had all the professional skills and interests of a contemporary landscape architect. Instead, Loudon used the term in Gilbert Lang Meeson's sense when talking about the relationship between buildings and contexts. In his terms, the architectural style and interior arrangement of structures should be planned in relation to the character of the situation. As editor of The Gardener's Magazine, Loudon referred to himself as the conductor. This reminds me of the 20th century idea that, like an orchestra, the environmental design professions need to be conducted. Thomas Mawson, the first president of the UK Institute of Landscape Architects in 1929, cited two of Loudon's works as his main textbooks, though he didn't get their names quite right. Well, did Loudon's plan for London have any influence? All I can say is it might have done, because his books had an enormous worldwide circulation in Britain, America, Australia and elsewhere. Before discussing the possible extent of this influence, I'd like to reveal that when proposing London's capital ring and loop in 1990, I'd known about Loudon's promenade for at least 12 years, but I really don't think I had it in my conscious mind when working on it. So, though I can't prove Loudon's influence on them, I will mention five possibilities. Joseph Paxton, William Light, Frederick Law Olmsted, Ebenezer Howard and Patrick Abercrombie. The Builder magazine in 1865 noted that there was a considerable resemblance between the subjects of Paxton's attention and those to which Loudon devoted himself, though the literary works of the latter must be considered of much greater importance. Loudon was the theorist, Paxton the man of action. I see the builder's comment as an understatement. In theory and in practice, Paxton's works were a continuation of Loudon's. Paxton admired Loudon's Encyclopedia of Gardening and must have read his supposition that Suppose, for example, a man desires to be a king. That is a desire sufficiently extraordinary. But if he will first make himself acquainted with the history of men who have raised themselves from nothing to become kings, he may very likely attain his object. Let no young gardener, therefore, who reads this, even if he can but barely read, Imagine that he may not become eminent in any of the pursuits of life. To desire and apply is to attain, and the attainment will be in proportion to the application. Paxton was, for example, fascinated by iron and glass construction. When using the ridge and furrow glazing system which Loudon had invented, Paxton designed the great stove at Chatsworth, which survived until 1920, 
and the Crystal Palace in London, which was moved to Sydenham and survived until the fire of 29th November 1936. In 1855, using another of Loudon's ideas, Paxton proposed a London promenade. If built, his Great Victorian Way would have been a ten-mile covered loop with a glass-roofed street, railways, shops, houses and three river crossings via inhabited bridges. Paxton also designed the famous park in Birkenhead, which inspired Olmsted to become a landscape architect, and he employed John Robertson, Loudon's most talented assistant, to draw the plan. Robertson, who died at the age of 43, wrote an obituary poem about his former master. He wielded no sword in his country's cause, but his pen was never still. He studied each form of nature's laws to lessen each human ill. That voice is hushed and lost the sound, employed to raise the poor. But the echo shall by his words be found to reach the rich man's door. Next, Olmsted. The National Association for Olmsted Parks describes Repton as the professional gardener who most influenced Olmsted. In design terms, this was correct. But Olmsted's knowledge of Repton surely came from Loudon's edition of his works. The editions Repton himself published were scarce and expensive. It's also likely that Olmsted's acquaintance with the term landscape architecture came from the title of Loudon's 1840 book on The Landscape Gardening and Landscape Architecture of the late Humphrey Repton. One can therefore wonder whether the idea of interconnecting parks as in Boston's emerald necklace, was part influenced by Loudon's and Paxton's proposals for promenades in London. The other source of influence on Olmsted's parkways was, of course, the use of avenues to interconnect green space in Paris. Next, William Light. The best example of a planned town with a breathing place green belt is Adelaide in Australia. William Light's 1837 plan for the town shows two clusters of urban development on either side of the River Torrey, surrounded by a belt of parkland. A breathing zone. Light proposed that any future urban growth should be outside the park belt, as it is. A book attributed to T.J. Maslan and called The Friend of Australia was published in 1830 and has been identified as the source of William Light's plan. It appeared one year after Loudon's 1829 plan for breathing places had been published with a concluding remark from Loudon that it could be used to plan a capital for an Australian Union. Next, Ebenezer Howard. Adelaide is specifically mentioned by Howard as a precedent for his Garden City's proposal. As Melanie Simo wrote, Loudon and Howard used remarkably similar diagrams. Howard's Garden Cities concept influenced Hampstead Garden Suburb, New Delhi, Canberra, Chandigarh, the British New Towns and a great many other city plans, including many in South America. It was, to say the least, immensely influential. Next, Patrick Abercrombie is a brilliant example of using the idea. 
he drew on Howard's and Olmsted's ideas for the open space section of the 1843-4 County of London Plan. The Metropolitan Greenbelt became official planning policy in 1955. It functions mainly as a negative policy, preventing the development of greenfield land, but not doing anything with it. Loudon's and Howard's proposals were better. Using current terminology, they saw the Green Belt as a place to develop natural capital. In Michael Gove's phrase, they wanted to spend public money on public goods. Instead of subsidising intensive agriculture, this could include investment in carbon sequestration, wood pasture, foraging, rewilding, aquifer recharge, water supply, recreation, scenic beauty, and of course, breathing zones. They would enhance the health of London's population and strengthen our individual immune systems to resist a whole range of diseases, including the coronavirus COVID-19 epidemic of 2020. To my mind, John Claudius Loudon should be seen as the father of modern urban landscape architecture and of landscape urbanism. Thank you.